at this time I'll call on Dr. Linda Young uh, to give her invocation. Good morning. May we pray? Dear God, you hold all things together by the power of your love. In times of uncertainty and change, help us to trust that you are at work in ways that go beyond our understanding. Do not allow us to be overwhelmed by anxiety or fear. Give us instead the courage to keep doing the right thing and the confidence to offer hope to others. May your spirit be present among us in the mouths of all who speak, in the ears of all who listen, and the heart of all we say and do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Y'all stand for a pledge of allegiance for your Scott Hunter before the invitation will lead our Thank you. 
appreciate this cooperation from the different institutions in providing the necessary information. Uh, we're, our committees are continuing to be more engaged uh, with the system. We appreciate the Chancellor's cooperation, his staff's cooperation with this. And there's some good communication going on. We just we look forward to cultivating that and expanding on that communication uh, so we can all make sound decisions together. Any other discussion? There being none, once again, we have a recommendation uh, on item 7A1, which is the purchase of instructional and administrative computers at Gadsden State. 7A2, Gadsden State Community College person the first purchase of upgrades to network infrastructure. 7A3, purchase of instructional commitment to equipment Machine 2 program, Wallace State Community College, Hansville. 7A4, Wallace State Community College, Hansville, purchase of instructional equipment for the Diagnostic Medical Sonography program. All those in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Motion carries. That's 7A5. I'd like to, before I make a recommendation for approval, I'm going to make that recommendation. I'd like to say a word or two about, uh, about this. Uh, I don't like the fact that we have to increase tuition. I, I've, I've gone on record many, many times about my concern uh, and the fact that this becomes an increasing barrier for our, uh, for our students. Uh, we are in the process at this point of making some pretty significant changes within the system. <coughs>
told someone earlier, I seldom talk myself out of something, and maybe I have it here, but uh, I tell you, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done, I think, in working with the legislature and with the executive branch to make college <coughs> affordable. And we, we, I think it probably needs to be one of our primary tasks. I think I appreciate you bringing up the Tennessee Conference. I think it was eye-opening for everyone.
consists of Crystal Brown and Susan Boyd. Uh, I want to compliment them and <coughs> congratulate them on the work that they've done. And in addition, the great input we've had from other trustees in this process, and especially the work that was done by the chancellor and his staff to, to uh, arrive at these policies. One, it's, it's some good work, good collaborative work, and uh, I think we've got a great finished product. It's not to say it's perfect. This is a living document. It can be changed by the trustees at any time. Uh, but, but we have a real sound foundation to start on. But thanks again for y'all's work, Crystal and Susan, and the work done by Ron. He's been, uh, Ron Pantor has been instrumental in coordinating and communicating with everybody to reach this point. I certainly appreciate it. And at that time, we presented you an overview of the history of developmental education. We talked about the state and national trends as it relates to um, what's going on to improve developmental education across this nation and here within our state. Uh, we provided you with an update of system statistics. And we also highlighted the Soros Institute at Shelton State Community College. Um, so and in October, you had an opportunity to hear from Dr. Ed Morente, who is an expert in developmental education. He provided a very thorough overview of um, placement and assessment, and I'm sure everyone who attended will agree that we all could have received college credit for the presentation <laughs> because it was that good and that thorough. Um, today, I'm going to focus on two areas um, that are um, have the potential to make some significant changes in the area of developmental education here within our system. 
The first being the placement test, in which we're moving to a new placement test um, starting this summer for some of our colleges and this fall for others. It is the AccuPlacer. And also, I'm going to discuss two pilot initiatives that deal with preparation. One on the, um, in the area um, or at the K-12 level and another at our community colleges. At the K-12 level, we're, um, I will be discussing the Southern Regional Education Board Readiness Courses. And at our community college level, I will be discussing um, pilot initiative for academic boot camps. I apologize for the smallness of the font, but you have the um, presentation in front of you. But I did want to present um, just some statist statistics for our fall enrollment for our first time freshmen. This is something that we um, historically present whenever we're giving an update on developmental education. This fall for our first time freshmen, the number of individuals who required at least one developmental course um, was 43.98%. Um, this is actually a 2.3 decrease from the previous fall cohort, so we do see a decrease. And if you look at the red line on this chart, hopefully you recognize this, that this is a downward trend. Um, from 2011 to uh, fall 2015, this represents a 6.3 decrease. Okay? Um, when we compare from one fall cohort to the other, the percentages aren't that large, but certainly this is the, tra the trajectory that we want to see. And hopefully with the implementation of our new placement test um, and some other initiatives going on in our colleges, we will see um, a greater decrease in the number of students requiring developmental education. So the first thing I would like to focus on is our AccuPlacer test. And the AccuPlacer, as you all know, is a placement test. It, as I mentioned, it will be replacing a compass which will expire in November. This is an adaptive test. Um, it's a little bit different in, from the compass test in that compass uh, students could um, achieve or receive a varied number of questions. But with the AccuPlacer exam, there's a standard number of questions that all students will receive for each subject area. Um, Two major differences that we are going to do moving forward will be standardized system scores. We'll be recommending this and also the use of multiple measures. And I'll talk more about these in just a minute. Another um, advantage to adopting the AccuPlacer is what they call the group model. This model will allow for the system to set up, do the preliminary setup for the AccuPlacer, which will expedite setup. And it will also guarantee that uh, there's standardization across the system in terms of our placement rules, in terms of our background questions. But this still will allow our colleges to have autonomy to make changes to meet their local needs. So when we talk about standardized cut scores, um, when I talk to groups, I often have to say, this was not a director, directive or a mandate by the system office. This is actually a grassroots effort that comes from our colleges. And I've heard it across the state of, as I visited um, various colleges and actually um, did a presentation at the ACT conference this um, year in the fall. There are some advantages to establishing standardized scores across the system. And these advantages include the following. We establish common placement score benchmarks of academic proficiency in developmental and college level courses. We improve the system's ability to actually track and um, analyze data um, that will allow us to determine the effectiveness of our developmental education programs. We minimize placement barriers when we have students that transfer from one community college to another. And one of the features of the AccuPlacer test, specifically in this group model, if a student gives their permission um, when they take the AccuPlacer test, if they happen to transfer, that score will be available to that transferring institution so they don't even have to bring it with them. It will be on record. And lastly, it provides a clear signal to our high schools about the preparation students need to um, have to be college ready. So um, in, at the end of January, we convened a committee that actually um, had the opportunity to take the specific test that AccuPlacer off offers. They were able to read uh, abundance of literature about the placement test scores, and they were actually able to look at scores from across this nation. And they um, set um, some standard 
standardized um, scores for in various areas, subject areas. A very um, important piece of this is also the holistic approach. Now, I've talked about this before. Um, the model that we use now, um, and the model that's used uh, most abundantly across this nation is students take a placement test, receive a score, and then they're placed in the appropriate course, whether it be developmental or a college level course. Um, we are moving beyond that, and we're looking at multiple measures now. And the Placer platform actually allows for us to incorporate these multiple measures within the um, placement platform. So instead of students being placed into a course solely on how they answer a set of math questions or solely on how they or how well they edit a paragraph, um, we can incorporate some non-cognitive factors in the um, placement equation as well. Um, research indicates that, and, and I'm sure everyone would, um, would know this as well, that success isn't just dependent upon um, how well students do on the test. We have to look at other factors as well. This includes the student's environment, what type of external support do they have? Do they have you know, positive spousal support? Do they have support from their jobs if they're working a full-time job to attend college? Um, do they have the academic background? What is the last course or the highest course that they took in mathematics? And then behavioral habits, and this is in line with our soft skills. What kind of study habits do these students have? We know if a student, and I often tell my own students, um, if they're not performing well on a test and it's simply because they haven't studied, then that's an easy fix. Um, but if there are other factors that are in play, then we can definitely address those as well. But we um, have established a set of questions that have been um, reviewed by not only Dr. Ed Morante, but Ron Gordon, who is also an expert, a national expert in assessment, and he um, is pivotal in reviewing and evaluating um, uh, the multiple measure pieces in California. We have developed a set of questions to be integrated into the Accuplacer platform. Also, the addition of these non-cognitive um, questions and this information can re um, be used to reduce the margin of error because every test, as you all know, is not perfect. Okay, and so this can reduce the margin of area error associated with it. Okay, so currently our old model is you know, students apply for um, admissions, they're accepted, part of the admissions process is the placement test, and once they get those scores, then they get uh, placed in the appropriate courses based on those scores. Now the new model will be, they will take the um, acuplacer test, embed it within that test, we have the non-cognitive questions, multiple choice questions, and then placement will be based on that, okay? So I wanted to give you an example of what one of those questions would look like. And this is an environmental question, and I'll read this because I know the font is small. Um, what is the following, uh, which of the following best describes your attitude toward homework? And so there are four choices, um, the first being a student that always uh, does the reading assignments, does the homework, and gets everything done on time. The second choice um, is a student that uh, reads some of the assignments, and will try to get the assignments in most of the time. And then the last two are uh, deal with a student that might choose, I may read, may do the assignments, and the last one, you know, I might not do anything, basically, okay? And so we, those questions are, 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 the choices are actually weighted. So depending on how the student answers the, quest, the questions, um, those percentage weights will be added to the um, score. And so there will be two scores that will be presented, a, an unweighted score and a weighted score, okay? Um, I would also like to add that these questions will be given to those students who are right on the cusp. And these are the students that are uh, just a, maybe a few points away, and if those questions were not there, would be placed into a developmental course. But depending on how they answer, they may um, be placed into a college level course. The equation is all done within the, the platform, so it will automatically be um, calculated within um, the platform. So there are multiple questions that will be used. It's not just one. There will be several that look at behavioral, 
several that will look at the um, subject matter. That's okay. a big change. It is. Okay, so um, we also have to look at preparation. One of the biggest barriers to students doing well on the placement test is whether or not they prepare. And the majority of students don't prepare. They come in cold, um, don't know the value of the test, they don't um, realize that this is going to may potentially place them into a developmental course that they very well uh, may not need to be in. Okay, so there are two pilot initiatives that we're um, looking at currently. Um, one, as I mentioned previously, deals um, with uh, a collaboration with K-12, and the other deals with students who um, they take the placement test, place in the developmental course but we want to give them an opportunity to strengthen their weaknesses and um, potentially move on to either an upper level developmental course or out of developmental course work altogether. So when I presented to you all before, I talked about transitional courses. I gave the examples of the sales model in Tennessee, but just as a refresher, transitional courses are high school um, courses developed by secondary and post-secondary instructors and offered no later than the 12th grade to students who are at risk for placing into developmental education courses. Um, the Southern Regional Education Board has two courses, one in math and one in literacy. Uh, these courses uh, are, are rigorous. Um, we had a team of representatives from uh, some of the pilot institutions meet this week and go over um, the coursework, uh, the curriculum in these courses, and this is nothing to sneeze at, okay? Um, but these courses present the material in a way that is more relevant to the students. For example, in the literacy courses, it is an integrated course. Um, the reading selections deal with uh, biology, which is my favorite area. Um, and it asks the students to do some extensive writing and actually um, do some research um, in writing uh, related to the topics that's discussed in biology. There's also a unit that deals with history and government. Um, and so uh, students that can do well in these courses uh, would be prepared for our college level courses. And the same is true for the math. So these courses are not designed for students that are on the lower end of the spectrum and they're not even designed for the students that are on the higher end that you know we know are going to go on to um, our two-year or four-year colleges. Um, but upon sex successful co um, completion, the models, and there are models in over 20 states currently, um, and most of them have the students, student success defined as a B or higher in the course, they do not have to take the developmental courses at the community college level and in some instances at some four-year schools ha that have agreed um, to accept the courses. <coughs> so what I have before you are five steps that were um, given to us by John Squires who is the director of the college readiness at the Southern Regional um, Education Board. Um, so we are looking to um, begin an initiative, which will be a, con a pilot initiative, which is a collaboration with K-12. Uh, the first step would be to establish college readiness benchmarks. As you all know, currently the benchmarks for ACT for um, <coughs> math and reading are set at 22, for English is at 18. For at our college is currently based on policy for um, math, for everything, the uh, exemption for the placement test is now at 20. The Developmental Act Education Task Force will be recommending that the English be um, lowered to 18, and that is in line with the national benchmark for the ACT. Okay. Um, the Alabama Community College System will collaborate with our K-12 partners in establishing these readiness courses um, for our underprepared students. And the key word is collaboration. Um, we met with a team um, led by Dr. Philip Cleveland um, about a week ago, and um, I compared it to a symbiotic relationship um, where we both will benefit <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> from our students lowering the remediation rate. Um, but our colleges also have to benefit in the sense that these students have to be successful in our college level courses. And we can't have one without the other or the courses are not um, deemed successful. Okay, all right. Um, there are currently five community colleges who have signed up for the uh, pilot. Those colleges include Enterprise, um, Wallace Selma, Central Alabama, 
Northwest Shoals, and Jefferson State Community College. Um, SREB will actually provide the training free of charge to the high school instructors that will be teaching these courses and our K-12 instructors who, or administrators who will serve as liaisons with our um, high schools will be invited to attend these sessions as well. Um, once these courses are implemented, of course we have to analyze and to deem what's successful. And what we'll be looking at is whether or not the students were successful, number one. Um, number two, whether or not these students actually um, go to college after they um, finish. And number three, um, how successful are these students in the college level courses once they um, begin them and complete them. And so tracking these students is gonna be vitally important, okay? We have to be able to follow these students once they graduate from high school and um, enter our colleges. Another piece and advantage to these courses, and this is seen um, in models in other states, is that there's an integration of what we refer to as college knowledge that there is time taken during these courses where students are introduced to, for example, the FAFSA, how to fill out that form. We know that is a huge barrier for a number of our students. Um, what it means to be a college student, okay? Simple things like what is a credit hour, okay? Um, the students um, in other states are invited to their partnering community colleges for campus visits. So this is really a wonderful opportunity for our community colleges to actually um, uh, recruit these students to attend our colleges. Okay? And so lastly, um, this, uh, we would need to have continued collaboration to improve readiness based on data. Okay, the second initiative is um, we, uh, as of this week, I've received final confirmation from the College Board that they are willing to partner with us along with Pearson to offer a limited number of uh, academic boot camps at our colleges. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, some administrators at Pearson and we had a discussion about this and I simply asked, um, could we have access to um, some of their software for our colleges and they simply asked how many, okay? So I thought seven was a, a, a reasonable number to ask for and they agreed and what Pearson will be um, providing for us is access to their software known as My Foundations Lab, and a number of our co colleges currently use this software already. Um, once uh, we talked to Pearson, and once we adopted AccuPlacer, I went back to AccuPlacer and said, hey, Pearson has agreed to give us um, some waivers for their software, what can you all do? Um, it was a little bit uh, more tedious um, to get the College Board on board and we had to go through a, a number of different um, steps because um, what we're asking for is a number of diagnostic tests from AccuPlacer. Now let me describe to you or uh, describe how that is different from our placement test. The placement test is um, giving is an indicator of what students know at that particular point in time. The diagnostic test actually identifies the strengths and weaknesses of the students. So if they you know, don't understand factoring, then this is gonna come out within the diagnostic test, okay? When we couple the AccuPlacer diagnostic test and identify those students' strengths and weaknesses, we will also couple that with the Pearson's My Foundations Lab, which creates a customized learning pathway for each student based on their diagnostic test. And so um, AccuPlacer already has a recommended model for these boot camps. They recommend that, um, of course, that these are offered to uh, students that are, are enrolling in our colleges. Um, they recommend that the uh, class consists of at least 20 to 25 students, but of course we know that can vary. Um, typically these boot camps are two to three weeks. There are variations to this, however, but what they have found is if you, um, allow students two weeks to work on their deficiencies, um, you can see significant increases and significant change. And when we talk about two weeks, we're not talking about all day. Um, they truly recommend about two hours of computer time. Um, other models have um, given students the software, tell them to go home and work on it, and as you can imagine, that um, does not work out very well. So it's important that these students are on campus working with a trained instructor and or facilitator in order to move through the uh, modules um, that they have been um, that have been created for their pathway. 
um, for our colleges that would want to participate and again I just received final word this week that it's a go so we will be sending out a, a memo um, announcing this um, the uh, instructors will have to go through training as I mentioned many of our instructors are already familiar with the Pearson products so um, in speaking with their representatives this could be no more than four hours to a whole uh, to a day's workshop um, to train and get um, instructors up to speed um, Colleges have to have dedicated lab space in order to do the boot camps, however. Excuse me. And there has to be a commitment to share the data, okay? They are giving us these fee waivers for the My Foundations Lab and for the diagnostic tests, so they do want to see how our um, students perform. And I am um, looking at this to probably be an aggregated study in which we pull all the data together and um, present it to um, the, both companies. So what's the overall advantage? Um, many of our colleges already have boot camps in one form or fashion and as you um, well know the advantage is a student that can move one up one developmental course or a student that can move up two and we do have students that do that or out of development course, courses it is a huge cost savings we're talking about two weeks as opposed to 16 weeks we're talking at a minimal cost as opposed to over four hundred dollars for a three-hour credit course so if we have students that are committed to this, then we can uh, make some significant headway. And I apologize for those pictures going over the, um, the, the font right there, but I, um, I'm, in closing, I would want to make you all aware that our state is very fortunate to have two individuals that are representing us on the National um, Board of Developmental Education. Those individuals are Annette Cook from Shelton State Community College. She is now serving as the Vice President and Meredith Sides from Northwest Shoals Community College and she is currently serving as the Secretary. Um, I attended NAID in March and we were also told that Alabama has um, some of the highest membership in uh, the chapters um, when compared to all other states. And that, I believe that speaks volumes to the commitment that our faculty and staff have to moving the needle forward as it relates to preparing our students for college success. Okay. And that concludes my presentation. Do y'all do y'all have any questions of me? I have a question about the big camps. So the, Dr. Robinson, the big camps, would it be considered remedial education because they're short and then so what the students will so I it's on your paper but I didn't mention it so you have the pretest and the pretest is actually the students taking the acuplacer test and if they um, place into a developmental course then that pathway will remediate that student so there's a post test and the students will take the acuplacer test again and that's how you determine their gains And for some students, especially those that may test on the lower end, it's still a win-win because they can um, possibly move out of the lowest developmental course and up to the next course. But as I said, we I've seen data um, from some of the colleges that have similar um, boot camps, and they have students that can move uh, two places. And that's simply because that student probably didn't have the, the potential but did not prepare for that placement test going in and just needed a refresher and was able to move, move out. No, that we count? No, 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 no. great question because there is no uh, one clear-cut definition of what college ready is readiness is but college readiness or career and college readiness is a students being academically prepared to n to move into a college level course or into the workforce without the need of development of coursework so and um, it is my um, 
sincere belief that with the changes that we are trying to implement moving forward, that we will definitely have some students that will be deemed college ready based on these changes. Did I gather that we're not currently using standardized testing for placements at all institutions? No, we have a floor currently in our policy that sets minimum minimum um, cut scores, but colleges have had the autonomy to adjust those scores. And just to clarify on the non-cognitive portion of the exam, so everyone who takes the placement test is going to get those questions. Okay. Right. We are working with the college board representatives right now and the and let me give y'all a little bit of background. Um, we are the second system to incorporate multiple measures across the board. Minnesota is the first, okay? Um, and so Minnesota, when they incorporated their background questions, they did it across the board. We didn't want to because we're dealing with students that have to sit for a number of multiple choice questions already. We want, only wanted to um, give the questions to those students who were on the cusp, th those who it would truly make a difference um, based on how they would answer those questions. So every student will get the general questions, but then if they place within a certain range, then they'll get the follow-up questions um, for that particular subject area. And then over on, on the boot camp side, under the recommended model, everything that you uh, listed there, do you have any metrics that, that help you understand if those improvements are sustained in your students? Not, not from a, a particular example from one model. Um, but I can definitely look at some schools that have, are currently doing that and see what their data looks like. Uh, just, um, not that we're doing this at all, but I, you know, it involves a lot of different levels. So, you know, when you teach to the test, to get, you know, I want to avoid that. It, mm -hmm. Actually improving the students' uh, methods since they're going to be uh, a sustainable success going forward through any class that <coughs> not just to move them up, you know, out of a development class or into a higher development class level. It'd just be interesting to know. I know it's not necessarily the goal of this. We're going to get them in class and get them in school and have them and work with them. I, I recognize that, but it would just be interesting to understand the value of the boot camp and a, a, child, a student's ability to sustain at a higher level. And, and let me speak to that just a little bit. Although the um, major emphasis will be on the, or can be, on the uh, coursework within the computerized modules. Um, one thing that has come out of my meetings with the representatives is the importance of the advising and the instructor involvement in these boot camps. It's, it's one thing to put the student in front of a computer and tell them just go, okay? But it's really important, and this will be stressed in training for those colleges that um, um, want to participate that whoever you have in the classroom, that they are not only a facilitator for that course content, but they're also a facilitator to help those students recognize other factors that are gonna be pivotal to their success in the classroom. And so that will be a component of the training. I would say one other thing you mentioned too is that the help with the students with the class, yeah. mentoring for that, you know, at, at early stages um, for high school students, I think is probably Yes. Um, 
the SRV um, has staff that will be evaluating and tracking. They, uh, John Squires has said this is part of their process. So and while they'll be doing their tracking, we'll be doing our tracking too. Um, it's gonna be vitally important. Thank you for those comments. We at Wallace Community College Dothan, we're so excited about this uh, award by the American Association of Community Colleges, which was presented last week at the national meeting. It is, uh, the Innovation Award emanates really from an instructional initiative that has been put in place at our college called ICANN, that's what we named it, which stands for improvement, constant, and never-ending. And it is a focus on instruction in the 10 largest enrollment general ed courses, looking at teaching methodologies used in that course, and then um, the student success rates in those courses, and holding everyone accountable for those rates and improvement in rates. So, it, we've seen real progress in this. It's a brainchild of our Dean of Instruction, Tony Holland, but we're very proud of that. We were very proud to be recognized at AACC.
Trustee Blake McAnally was uh, recognized as a Citizen of the Year for Decatur Morgan. And uh, that's quite an honor in any size community in our state. I'm familiar with it in our area. I know that I've never gotten it, but no people that have. <laughs> and and it's, it, it's just, just usually uh, one of the key qualities they have is that of a servant leader. And so I know that, that that's one of the reasons that Blake got it. But anyway, congratulations, Blake. And, Best wishes and, and well deserved recognition. Thank you. I would certainly encourage everyone to look up. Uh, in your words, it was a great, a great article that went with uh, with the announcement that I think you'd all enjoy reading. So. Any comments by trustees? Anything else to come before the board? Uh, we'll uh, meet for our work session at 1 p.m. in the President's Conference Room and we'll be extended somewhat. Uh, we'll be doing a little extra orientation on workforce development. Look forward to that. Uh, our next Board of Trustees meeting will be May 11th at 10 a.m. in the, here in the boardroom in Montgomery. There being nothing else, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? and adjourned.